All black everything, all black you know All black in the name of all my black heroes All black everything, all black polos All black medallions, yeah, all black, <laughs> yo Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark MC Neal. We're joined today by E. James West, a research associate in American history at the North Umbria University. He's the author of several books, Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bennett Jr., Popular Black History in Post-War America, published in 2020. And he's talking to us today about a house for the struggle, the Black press and the built environment in Chicago published in 2022. Both books were published by our friends over at the University of Illinois Press. Uh, how are you doing today, Professor Dr. West? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, appreciate you taking the time and inviting me on. I, I really love these projects because they both of the books, um, I, and, and I almost want to ask, is there a trilogy? Right? Is there going to be a third you know, book in the cycle or the series? Because it really does kind of capture on a granular level the relationship between Black intellectuals and uh, the fourth estate um, in a city like Chicago in, in the early 20th century, right? And everyone thinks they know Ebony Magazine and Johnson Publications, right? Folks have heard of the Chicago Defender, um, but you really lay out a, a rich history uh, about these entities and their role in terms of Black folks in these communities seeing themselves, you know, Black Chicago being represented, uh, you know, on a national scale and, and what have you. Uh, explain a little bit to our audience how you came to these particular projects. Yeah, sure. Um there is actually a, a third book in the trilogy, if you like. Uh, so that's a full biography of, of Lorraine Bennett Jr., um, mm -hmm. which came out this year from University of Massachusetts. Uh, and that, yeah, that allowed me to kind of expand a lot on some of the work mm -hmm. that I did in the first book, which was was really grateful for that opportunity. Um, yeah, I mean, my background to this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a white British scholar, um, in my interest in the black press uh actually came through advertising primarily oh, um so an early research project that i did was uh focused on the singer james brown mm -hmm. and his relationship to black power activism um and brown was criticized by some members of the black community <laughs> for his relationship particularly to richard nixon and uh he actually took out big adverts in in some of the the big black periodicals laying out what what he saw as his contributions to to the black community and justifying his relationship to nixon and this idea of black capitalism in the late 60s and early 70s so that was really the entry point for me into the black press um and it's been an ongoing process and it's still very much an ongoing process um you know i, I don't claim to to know to you know no everything there is to, to know about this incredibly complex and, and diverse institution uh, within Black life. Um, uh, but my focus, as you've suggested, has, has really been on Chicago for the most part, um, which is home to some of, you know, the most influential and significant Black periodicals of, of the 20th century. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's my my entry point into, into the broader discussions around and, and scholarship on the Black press. You opened the book talking about the Tribune, what was then their 50th anniversary, and the opening of this huge edifice right in Chicago, you know, to the idea of the power of the American press. Um, you describe this moment in relationship to what you call the built environment of Chicago. Unpack a little bit for our audience this dynamic of, uh, you know, what you think about when you talk about a built environment. Yeah, sure. So uh, within the context of this book, uh, I'm talking about the built environment in terms of obviously buildings um, and networks within the city. Um, and Chicago is, is such a fantastic city architecturally. Right, right. Um, and I was really interested in unpacking Chicago's dual status as a media capital and an architectural center. Mm -hmm. Um and one of the reasons that I started actually this book, because, you know, uh, listeners might be thinking, well, it's, it's a book about the black press. Why is he starting by talking about the Tribune? <laughs> right. Um, because I wanted to, to very explicitly pivot away from that and think about, OK, you know, we 
a lot of people are familiar with the Tribune and its iconic building, the Tribune Tower. And when people think of media in Chicago, often they might think of the Chicago Tribune as, mm -hmm. you know, historically the, the largest paper in, in the city. Um, but the Tribune, through its coverage and through its building, maps certain distinct media geographies. And many of the communities within Chicago aren't necessarily included or are misrepresented through those editorial like depictions and through the media geographies that are created by the Tribune and by other white dailies such as the Chicago Daily News. Um, so I really wanted to, to pivot away from the Tribune and say, OK, you know, we have this story and there's the fantastic story about the Tribune Tower competition and all of that. Mm -hmm. But what happens when we we reorient that and look to different communities and different media concerns and different media geographies within Chicago? Because we get a very different vision of the city and the media of Chicago and the communities that consume that media. Um, and that maps onto, you know, the very clear and enduring patterns of segregation, racial segregation within Chicago. Um, and that connects to where media concerns in Chicago are, because the vast majority of the buildings that I talk about um, in this book are on the south side of Chicago. Right. Um, historically, you know, the center of, of uh, Chicago's black metropolis. Um, so it was it was really using the Tribune and, and pivoting away from that familiar story and and, you know, thinking about, well, OK, so what? If we look at different media, if we look at different spaces, if we look at different communities, like what other stories can we tell about Chicago? Um, and how does that give us maybe a fresh insight into the Black Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, one of the most intensively studied Black communities in the United States. Um, but also it's a community that is so incredibly rich and, and, and diverse and, and, and complex that, you know, we, there's still so much to unpack and, and discover about that community and, and how that community changed over time. You know, you mentioned the significance of Chicago as kind of a, 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 a Black community, a Black metropolis. Um, much of the history of this book is unfolding at the same time that St. Clair Drake and Horace Clayton, uh, you know, published their, you know, great ethnography of Chicago. Uh, how much did Clayton and Drake lean on the reporting of a newspaper like The Defender, not so much in terms of doing an ethnography, but knowing who to talk to and what kind of questions to ask. What I try to do through the book and the most, the two most obvious examples are uh, the Chicago Defender and then Johnson Publishing Company, which are the, the two most prominent uh, enterprises that I talk about. You know, the black press, I, I'm interested not just in individual black newspapers or magazines mm -hmm. and the editorial content that they might have and the audiences that they might relate to. But I'm really interested in black institutions, the Defender as an institution and what that means. You know, it is a paper, but also it's a community anchor. Um, and the building is a really important part of that. You know, similarly for, for Johnson Publishing Company, you know, Johnson Publishing, yes, it publishes Ebony and Jet sure. and ne Negro sure. Digest or Black World. Um, but also there's just an incredible array of other things that that company does. Um, and, you know, there's been some really fantastic work forthcoming or recently out about, you know, like the fashion fair, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, the radio or television enterprises. And so much of that comes through the physical space of the building. Um, so that was really the entry point for me, thinking about, the buildings encompassing these other things that the Defender and, and Johnson Publishing did. You know, it's the the magazines and newspapers obviously are the most important things, but there's a host of other charitable business political enterprises mm -hmm. that run through these institutions, these really critical black institutions. Um, so yeah, that was that was part of what I was trying to do. You, you talk about how, you know, Johnson Publishing, the Chicago Defender, helped to map real and imagined geographies, right? It, it becomes a community space, literally, um, in both the newspaper and, you know, the Johnson publications, whether Ebony or Jet, they're Chicago entities, but they both have, or all through 
three of them have national readership. Um, I think most folks outside of Chicago who read the Ebony magazine never thought about its Chicago roots, <laughs> right? The Defender, you know, outside of the Pittsburgh Courier, you know, really is the most well-known <laughs> example of the independent press throughout the 20th century. Talk about how significant it was. And you just, you know, suggested some of this in your comments, but on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, how important was it to have a space for folks to come together, to think together, <laughs> to work together, to write together? Uh, I was struck by, you know, the, the counterpoint that you present from the Tribune Tower to the humble beginnings of the Defender, right? And somebody's house right for the first 15 years right you know talk about how important it was for these institutions to be on the ground in the way that they were and then as you talk later when they moved to new spaces um their proximity to black community changes and shifts a little bit yeah absolutely so one of the things that i was quite interested in is the gap between the way that these buildings or spaces are described editorially by the publications <laughs> housed within them and then actually what they look like <laughs> um because you know when you when you read the descriptions you're like oh my god this this building is incredible it's it's this amazing space and then you might visit and you're kind of like huh i mean it's not you know but I think for me, that's really telling because these buildings loom so large within the imagination yeah. of black folk in, in and beyond Chicago, because they're just such that that's such an important symbol for um, for black economic like advancement for, for racial uplift for, for different things. Um, so I, I found that space quite interesting. Um, and then, yeah, as, as you rightly say, the Defender has these quite humble beginnings. Um, so the Defender, for, for those unfamiliar, starts in, in 1905 and Robert Abbott, who is the publisher, he's a, a southern migrant who moves to Chicago. Um, he very briefly tries to have his own offices, but it's not financially viable. Right. So he basically publishes the Defender out of his lodgings. Um, so he's re he's renting a, a room from a woman called Henrietta Lee uh, on South State Street. And the Defender basically just stays in that building for the first 15 years of its existence. And as the paper grows, Abbott's enterprise grows and it kind of gradually takes over Henrietta Lee's entire house. <laughs> so, yeah. And and that's that's born of necessity but also the paper and Abbott do a really great job of folding it into the kind of mythology of the defender that, that yeah. develops over time. Um, and you have this, this tale of the humble beginnings of the defender. And this really reinforces its self appointed role as a community institution that's, you know, rooted in the black community and for the black community. Um, so that kind of spatial politics and, and how the paper develops it's framed in a way that really emphasizes uh, its importance as a, as a voice for Black people. What was the relationship between the Defender and, and the Johnson Company? Uh, Johnson Company, of course, doesn't launch until the 40s. The Defender has a much earlier history. What, what was the relationship between the two entities? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of an interesting relationship. Um, by the time that John H. Johnson, his first publication is the Negro Digest. He he right. begins that in, in 1942. And, you know, that has its own interesting building history, which we might want to talk about. But by the time that he starts that enterprise, um, Robert Abbott has has died. And the control of the Defender has been taken over by John Senstak, um, who's, a, who's a younger relative of, of Abbott, who he's kind of groomed to take over throughout the 1930s. And Johnson, John Johnson and John Senstak, by all accounts, um, have a, a respectful relationship. Mm -hmm. um, one that actually contrasts with the somewhat contentious relationship that John Johnson has with a number of other black publishers. Mm -hmm. um, the Defender and Johnson Publishing, they, they kind of do different things. Um, you know, Johnson and, and Johnson Publishing is, is most famous for Ebony, which is a quite glossy consumerist monthly periodical. Mm -hmm. And the Defender 
as a weekly and then by the 50s it, it becomes a, a daily um it's doing something a little bit different so even though they're spatially in proximity within chicago uh, they're not necessarily in, in direct competition um so that allows them to coexist um and allows them to yeah that their relationship to each other um is quite interesting um and then also they both over time move into buildings that are closer to the center of chicago and further away from what historically was the heart of the black community on the south side yeah. so that creates like similar issues for both johnson publishing and the defender because then they have to justify what their continuing relationship is with the black community because yeah. it's like you know your building is no longer really in a black community so how do you justify that role um when you're when you're you're in a, a different space within within the city we often think about the chicago defender as being kind of on the cutting edge of of telling telling the story of black folks you know uh, on a daily basis and ebony and jet particularly ebony always seen much more fixated with the optic of blackness and particularly black middle classness um you know your book really bo bookends you know the the early part of the 20th century in the 1970s but when we think about ebony particularly in the 19 late 70s and 80s right it really is this kind of glossy mag that gives you a kind of entree point into the upper black middle class and, and mainstream black life you know etc that being said, you know, when we think about the Defender, right, we think about the way that it really carried the torch for the story of Emmett Till, um, you know, for a national audience, right? And, and that was, I think, how most Black people imagined the role of the Black press. Both the Defender and Johnson have to face challenges in the 1960s as the politics begin to shift, right? Much less of a concern about optics, right? And literally a kind of militant revolutionary ethos that's out that's out there that neither one of them are both prepared <laughs> to do or uh, or inclined to do. Can you talk a little bit about the political dynamics you mentioned with Chuck Stone, uh, who of course finished his career down here at UNC um, when he becomes you know editorial director at the Chicago Defender and folks felt as though he was very militant. And then, you know, Johnson is dealing with these subsequent kind of challenges himself, um, particularly in the kind of stories that they were willing to tell, right? Not covering, um, you know, the incarceration of, say, someone like H. Rap Brown or along those lines. So uh, lay out a little bit about the political dynamics as we see this kind of shift to civil rights, to Black power, and what role these two entities would play. Yeah, sure. So um, this was actually one of the the most fun aspects of this project for me, um, mm. thinking about how both uh, the Defender and, and Johnson Publishing, and then you know also newspapers such as Muhammad Speaks and other entities, yeah. how they <laughs> engage with this shift in the 60s and how that shift kind of plays out spatially within the buildings that they're using. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of specific examples in relation to both the Defender and Johnson Publishing. So... One of the things I actually found out in the process of writing this book was uh, for a period, the Chicago Urban League rented space in the <laughs> Chicago Defender building, um, which I just found fascinating. And there were all of these memos, um, shout out to Chicago Public Library and, and the Woodson, obviously a fantastic collection um, mm -hmm. and lots lots of material related to the Defender. Um, and they have lots of uh, memos which, which speak to this the role of the Chicago Urban League renting space within the Defender building um, and then what that relationship looked like, um, which was which was quite interesting. Um, but then also you mentioned Chuck Stone. You see more militant um, or more outspoken editors. Uh, you know, the, the newsroom becomes a battleground yeah. for these contestations over editorial policy. And Chuck Stone is one figure who is very he you know is a larger than life figure within the newsroom and he comes to almost to physical blows with john senstack uh, around the direction of the defender and then he's eventually fired and it's done in a very very public way it's kind of staged a staged firing in the newsroom 
And then you see protests and you see pickets mm -hmm. outside the Defender building. And one of the images that actually I included in the book um, is an image of, of people uh, marching outside the Defender building. And on first glance, the kind of optics of the era, you might think, oh, this is this is a protest around black civil rights. This is people right. Right. marching outside this <laughs> iconic building in Chicago. But it's actually like people trying to pick it or boycott the defender because they disagree with some of the editorial decisions <laughs> um, and then some of the labor politics as well. Um, so that was, yeah, that I just really thought image was fascinating to me. And then in relation to Johnson Publishing, you see a similar thing in terms of pickets and boycotts. Um, so you see that both in Chicago and then also at satellite offices. So uh, <laughs> New York, there's a quite prominent boycott um or sorry not a boycott a, a a picket um which is in response to the uh perceived colorism of ebony mm -hmm. magazine mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. gender politics of the magazine mm -hmm. and that that actually leads to a really important um issue on on the black woman which is one of the first uh first times that ebony puts a, a very dark skinned right. black woman right. with a nat natural right. haircut on its cover uh, and then uh, Don Lee or Haki Madabuti, um, a prominent Chicago poet and activist, he he leads boycotts in the Chicago offices. Yeah. Um, so you you see that as well. So that's the kind of subversion of the symbolic potency of the yeah. buildings because activists understand like the symbolic value of the building, so they understand how effective. It could yeah. be to stage a boycott outside the building or pick it outside the building. Yeah, you, know, you you know you produce a, a letter from an editorial you know person within Johnson, you know, as he resigns, and as you write in the book, he literally resigns and then just walks down the block to the office of Muhammad Speaks, you know, who were very interested right, in bringing him on board. You know, there is a certain kind of irony that the success of the defendant of Johnson Publishing Company, on the one hand, obviously creates competitors, right? but also people who are competitive who push the politics a little differently, right? So when you think about, you know, there are many reasons why Elijah Muhammad might have moved Muhammad Speaks from New York to Chicago, um, you know, part the fracturing relationship, obviously, with Malcolm X. Um, but it also is because, you know, Chicago is this kind of hotbed, you know, for Black journalism and, and Black thought, right? And he could benefit physically by being there and taking advantage of folks who have particular skill sets. Um, so you, you you mentioned that, you know, Muhammad Speaks was willing to bring a non-Muslim people to be writers. I think about, you know, my first introduction to the white ethnomusicologist, Charlie Kyle, you know, came from pieces that he wrote in Muhammad Speaks. But you also mentioned Hakeem Abudi, right? And there's no question that what he does to launch Third World Press is also a part of the response to what he might see as a lack of accountability on some of these, you know, publications to really address what's happening in the Black community. If there's a connective tissue there, um, it's Lerone Bennett. Talk about how significant Lerone Bennett was to this period, you know, in Ebony Magazine and how he, you know, carves out really his own space. I, I remember being an a a undergraduate student in the 1980s and reading Lerone Bennett stuff and feeling like this strong disconnect between what I read from Lerone Bennett and what Ebony was and being shocked that Lerone Bennett was an editor <laughs> at, at Ebony. Yeah, so there's a couple of really interesting characters at Johnson Publishing. Um, Lerone Bennett is one of those people. Hoyt Fuller is another uh -huh. one of those people. Jonathan Fenderson uh, mm -hmm. wrote a really, really fantastic book about Fuller and the politics of yep. the Negro Digest Black Absolutely. World. Absolutely, yep. And uh, yeah, I'll, th there's other figures, you know, Alan Morrison, and Irabel Thompson, etc. cetera, but I'll, I'll focus just on, on Fuller and, and on Bennett. And I talk about them in the book in terms of how they're able to navigate the physical space mm -hmm. of the building and how that maybe speaks to their <laughs> standing within the company and also their relationship with Johnson. And uh, Hoyt Fuller is a figure who has a very, I would say, ambivalent relationship to Johnson Publishing. Um, he, he worked at the company in the 50s and then he left because he was quite dissatisfied and he he traveled quite a lot uh in in europe and north africa and other places 
and then he's he's lured back to the company by Johnson to start the the revamped Negro Digest, which is relaunched in the early 60s as more of a, a journal of kind of literary criticism and, and black right. thought. Um, but he doesn't like he has an office in the building, but his his staff is often quite isolated from everyone else. And they talk about just being like on a little island uh, within the Johnson Publishing Building, just kind of on their own and left to their own devices. Mm. Um, And then he, uh, (coughs) excuse me, he he, he tries to exert little subversive influences. And you see that within the building. So he has this, uh, it's like a little newsletter. It's called JPC Iana. And he circulates this within the building and to like other editors who are, you know, sympathetic to his politics. Um, and it, this is a kind of satirical take on the day to day workings of Johnson and what happens in the offices. And it's just such a wonderful document. And it uh, it really speaks to like the complexities that Fuller has with Johnson Publishing as an enterprise and his place within it, and then how those complexities and ambivalences play out spatially within the actual office that he's working in on a, on a day-to-day. Um, so that's that's Fuller, and then over time, Fuller becomes more marginalised, and this leads to his quite abrupt firing and the cancellation of the, the renamed Black World in the 1970s. And just before that... Um, he has an encounter, which I think is quite informative with Johnson. Fuller talks about this encounter with Johnson where they both get into the elevators of the building, just dead silence. And then it kind of goes up and then Fuller gets out. And then Johnson just kind of goes up to his executive penthouse on the top floor. And it's, you know, it's it's just kind of like, oh, okay, this is, there's no coming back from this now. You know, this is, this is the end for, for me at Johnson Publishing and also Black World. Um, so that yeah that is just a little anecdote about their personal interactions within the building that I think really speaks to the complexities and ambivalences that Fuller has um, and also his role within the company um, which is a quite ambivalent role in many ways and then how that maps onto the way that physically he he moves throughout the space Um, and then Bennett is someone who his relationship with with Johnson is is really very strong. I mean, politically and ideologically, they're quite different. Um, mm-hmm. But they're both they both kind of come from from the same soil. Really, they're both southern migrants, and they're born as the crow flies. I think it's like fifty or sixty miles away from each other. Um, okay. So they, you know, but, uh, Bennett was born born in in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and and Johnson's from Arkansas City. So I think they're kind of southern roots. Um, they understood each other yeah yeah, they kind of have an understanding um and that maps onto their relationship and then it 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 maps onto Bennett being one of the very very select group of uh, editors who's allowed into like Johnson's inner sanctum on the on the top floor of of the the Johnson building um the the new Johnson building that opens in the early 1970s and uh also Bennett's one of the very few people who visits Johnson's house um, his, his private residence, you know, those mm-hmm. those type of things. Um, and then Johnson and Fuller also use their workspaces, you know, they, they decorate it uh, to, to kind of as a representation of their own politics and things like that. Um, so, yeah, those, those two guys are quite interesting in terms of the role, the specific role that they had within Johnson Publishing mm-hmm. and then the way in which their role and their influence manifested through the way that they navigate the actual physical workspace talk a little bit about the legacies of of both the defender and johnson publishing um you know before we started this interview we were chatting beforehand and and you know the folks at the ford foundation and and mellon got together to figure out how to camp for these archives of of the johnson publication um and and now so many more folks will have access to them Ebony itself has gone through all kinds of uh, different iterations over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, a larger, you know, question about 
the Black legacy press and its relationship to the internet and digitization and all those kinds of things. But what's the legacy of, of the Defender and Johnson Publishing at this point, you know, from your purview? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, for me, part, part of the legacy is the physical spaces in terms of the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the arguments that I make in the book is thinking about these buildings in and of themselves as archives, as repositories, um, you know, reading reading between the bricks as, as well as the lines in terms of trying to pass out the histories of these these publications. And when I started this project, I initially wanted to kind of come to, to write through to, to the present. And it quickly became clear that that wasn't possible um, just because of how much material I wanted to cover. Um, but also it was a, addressing somewhat different questions. Um, so the the book, A House for the Struggle, really focuses, as you've already mentioned, from the late 19th, early 20th century into the 70s. Mm -hmm. And then at the moment, I'm working on a project which looks at the Chicago's Black Press and, and the buildings really from the 70s. Mm -hmm. And those are really questions about urban renewal, about redevelopment, about the, the this narrative of the decline of the Black Press, um, and trying to think about you know what how do black media buildings like how do we understand them when black media leaves like mm -hmm. what role mm -hmm. do these buildings have when their occupants are no longer the publications that were most connected to them um and the johnson publishing building is a fantastic example of that um so the the johnson publishing this iconic headquarters which opened it was uh the first designed by john matusame um, the first building on the South Loop designed by a black architect mm -hmm. opened in the early 70s. Incredible fanfare immediately became like a really, really popular tourist destination and uh, just this this great landmark. And then over the following decades, as Johnson Publishing peaked in terms of influence and then started to, to slide, um, the building itself becomes this time capsule almost because uh, mm -hmm. the interiors never get updated. Right. And architectural critics like Lee Bay and others have, have talked about the interiors of the Johnson building as this just incredible time capsule of like early 70s black cultural mores. Um, but by the 21st, the early 21st century, the building is physically crumbling. Um, mm -hmm. And this maps onto the declining significance of particularly mm -hmm. Ebony and of Johnson mm -hmm. Publishing more generally. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the building is eventually sold to Columbia College Chicago. They have a big project where they're going to turn it into a new library. That doesn't work out. The building stays vacant for a number of years. And then against the backdrop of the liquidation of Johnson Publishing and the fire sale of its own assets, the building itself is redeveloped and turned into uh, just condominiums. <laughs> and, and and its iconic interiors are just gutted and it, it's, it's just a very antiseptic space now um and there's there's just so much that we can unpack just around like mm -hmm. the recent history of that individual building and the way that that layers onto these broader debates around the black press and the continued significance and role of, of black newspapers and, and periodicals in the 21st century um and yeah it's just a really fascinating for me i think a really fascinating way of thinking about the black press you know what how do we think about the buildings and how do the role of the buildings change and then you know how can we link that back to this these broader debates uh which i think are you know really important questions about about the role of the black press today yeah thank you um and and thank you really um this is a, an impressive contribution to a part of Black intellectual history. Um, we've been talking with Dr. E. James West, a research associate in American history at Northumbria University. He's the author of Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bennett Jr., Popular Black History in Post-World America 2020, A House for the Struggle, The Black Press in the Built Environment in Chicago 2022, both of those by the University of Illinois Press. And if you could quickly shout out the book that you've also written on Lerone Bennett. Yeah, sure. So that was with uh, University of Massachusetts. It's actually part of its new African-American intellectual history series. 
uh, and that's called Our Kind of Historian, uh, the work and activism of, of Lorraine Bennett Jr. Uh, and that came out earlier this year as well. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Our pleasure's all mine. I appreciate it. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black 